This video is sponsored by Audible. Well, it's been a while since I made one of these What Went Wrong videos. Probably because the last two I made, despite being incredibly popular, have either been demonetized or just deplatformed altogether. I love the but, you know, it's 2020. A new year, a new decade, so maybe it'll be one that is free of constant YouTube demonetization and other bullshit copyright claims. So in this edition of What Went Wrong, we'll be taking a look at another of Cartoon Network's biggest hit shows. A show which followed the adventures of three outcast children named Ed, Ed, and Eddie. Who would always be thinking up new ways to scam the other kids in the neighborhood so they can use the money to buy those oh so delicious, illogically oversized jawbreakers? As a kid, I wanted nothing more than the opportunity to be able to try one of those incomprehensible oversized sugar globes myself, and use some of my own pocket money to buy the largest one I could find, which was about the size of a tennis ball, paling in comparison to the show size, but pretty big in real life standards. I quickly found out that unlike the characters in the show, I was struggling to unhinge my jaw like a snake and stretch my cheeks like a hamster to accommodate this spherical monster and so had to resort to licking it like an ice cream instead. And I kid you not, after about a few hours of licking away, my tongue actually began to bleed. Pretty badly. I'm not sure if it was down to the sweet itself, or if my tongue is just weak, but either way, out of sheer traumatization, I have never had a jawbreaker again, even to this day. I think the only reason I, I chose jawbreakers because they're like the most horrid candy to eat. I agree with you, Danny Antonucci, but we'll come back to you in a tick. Being a child from the 90s who grew up with Cartoon Network, Ed, Ed and Eddie was a show I would tune in to watch every day. And obviously, I absolutely loved it. It was colorful, creative, had a wide variety of diverse and interesting characters, some of which are still being memed even today. Hello, Ed boys. Not to mention, it was absolutely hilarious. This is a perfect spot, huh, guys? Hey, dorks! Get out of my backyard! Where? Kevin already has a clubhouse here. Shut up, Ed. And I'm clearly not the only one who thought that, as the show was one of Cartoon Network's biggest successes and was a huge hit with both critics and audiences, attracting over 30 million households and being broadcast in over 120 countries being both popular among kids and adults alike. Having more than its fair share of adult humor thrown in. Read a magazine? I would if I knew where Ed hit him. Oh, you read those? Bitch! Weekend wrecker! Of all the ink! If your magazines are in that sewer, ready, they would be totally illegible. The text smeared by the damp sludge. It's the pictures I'm worried about! Mom's cleaning up my room and she's making me throw out all my cool stuff! But luckily, I was able to save the... Magazines! <laughs> it's winter without a snow job, that's not good! Get it? Snow? Job? Yes, well... This show is actually Cartoon Network's longest running original series, where the first episode aired in January 1999, along with 130 more, plus 4 TV specials, and a television film finale which aired in November 2009. An almost 11 year run. And no, before you go correcting me in the comments section, we're not including shows like The Powerpuff Girls, which yes, have technically been airing new episodes right up to 2017, but have taken long hiatuses between new episodes, and have undergone large changes with various teams working on them so I don't count it as one big series. Ed, Ed and Eddie though, like with many other shows in their long years of airing, did begin to decline during its later season. Purr like a bunny, purr like a bunny. And I know, to a lot of people that seems like a ludicrous claim, and that the show was pure gold from start to finish. But after re-watching the series, yeah, there were definitely some aspects that fell from grace as the show went on and I'll be giving examples of these during the review. But before we take a look at what made the show bad, let's take a look at what made the show great. Awesome, I don't know, but very 
good, yeah? The show was created by a man named Danny Antonucci, to me, your maker. who upon surface level probably wouldn't be your first choice for someone to produce a kids cartoon. And saying no, F you, I don't do kids stuff. Yeah. Not just because of his not giving a shit attitude, but also the history of his previous animations, which were much darker and edgier animations aimed towards adult audiences. In fact, Antonucci himself had no intention of doing a kids show either, and only agreed to do so as part of a dare. I'm not making this up. That was uh, on a dare, I heard, that you uh, it was a kids <laughs> show because you had a lot, done a lot of violent stuff in your career. The inspiration for the Eds came from three character designs Danny drew up for a shoe commercial called Kung Shu. <laughs> Eventually these characters would evolve into the familiar faces we see today, and be dubbed Ed, Ed, ah! Ow! and Eddie. Antonucci pitched the idea to both Cartoon Network and Nickelodeon, and though seeming like he would initially go with Nickelodeon, he eventually decided to go with Cartoon Network, as they agreed to give him more creative control. Which, funny enough, wouldn't be the last time for Nickelodeon to lose out on a great show to Cartoon Network. Further talks were made as the show's premise was developed, offering some bold new ideas such as the show having a 2 11 minute episode format as opposed to Cartoon Network's usual 3 7 minute episodes. The show would also not be animated by the studio's usual Hanna-Barbera productions and would instead be handled by AKA Cartoons, a Canadian based animation studio Canadians are weird. most notably recognised by its incredibly disturbing studio logo. That's disturbing. And so on January 4th, 1999, the first episode of Ed, Ed and Eddie hit the screens, with the episode titled The Ed Touchables, a theme which would run through all the episode title cards which would have the word Ed substituted to a reference or phrase, such as Pop Goes the Ed, Once Upon an Ed, Robin Ed, and my personal favourite, Mission Ed Possible. The title cards would also have this realistic art style which I quite liked, always reminded me of the highly detailed stills you'd get in classic cartoons, or even Spongebob for that matter. This look unsure to you. No. The plot of each of the episodes would typically have us follow the adventures, kill me, of three boys named Ed, Ed and Eddie, as they think of various ways to scam the local neighbourhood kids out of their money. These scams would range to all sorts of crazy shenanigans, such as faking a rocket car which can travel around the world, faking a thingamajig box, and even constructing an entire cardboard city. But then you would also have some non-scam related plots, such as Ed sleepwalking through the cul-de-sac and causing havoc, or having the Ed spending the entire episode chasing a balloon, or just having the Eds breaking reality altogether. Did you see that? Weird. Oh well, can't beat him. Eat him. Not bad. Despite the initial zany aspects of these plots, when you strip them down to the bare bones, they're actually pretty down to earth situations. Situations which are being showed from a kid's perspective and wild imagination. Such as when Eddie experiences his first pimple, though it starts off small in size, the more the other kids begin to notice and make fun of it, the larger and more grotesque it becomes. A kind of metaphor as to how the person may imagine an imperfection in themselves over exaggerating it in their minds as they fear of what the others may think of it, or how the Eds decide they want to skip school and so literally construct a plane to escape the grounds as if the school was like a prisoner of war camp, or how Ed is grounded in one episode and it shows how his parents have literally removed the stairs to stop him from escaping. All we have to do is go up the- What happened to the stairs? My parents took them down cause I am grounded. Or even the simple trouble of new childhood clothes feeling stiff and uncomfortable. The humour in this show as I said was fantastic, the slapstick is well balanced, wasn't too goofy or over the top, making the characters look like they were in genuine pain at times, and that of course is hilarious. I remember the first episode I watched where the Eds are trying to babysit Ed's younger sister Sarah, Eddie is trying to juggle as a form of entertainment when suddenly a cactus impels his hand. 
His scream along with his expression had me in absolute fits. Another classic moment is when Eddie is launched through the air and lands at a thorn bush, to which Ed just carefree drags his impaled body as Eddie lies there in sheer agony. Alright, so let's take a look at the characters. One interesting thing to note about this show is that throughout its entire run, there were only 13 characters on screen, with no adults or parents in sight. Though the parents are referenced as existing off screen, I have taken the liberty of phoning all your parents! What? Huh? Oh man! You didn't! We never actually physically see them, which led to the popular theory that the kids are all actually dead from different periods of time, and that the cul-de-sac is kind of like a state of purgatory for them. Which I think is actually a pretty cool theory, and could actually hold up. Dad? Wait! Um, the grades are in Greek this year! I did good! I swear! Uh -oh. Ignore that, ignore that, ignore that, ignore that. Right, let's start by looking at the main trio. First up, Ed, my personal favorite. Hey! Where did you guys go? <laughs> Come on! Ed, who is voiced by Matt Hill, is the large, simplistic, but also lovable character. He seems to have a positive, carefree attitude and can often be running around with his trademark goofy laugh. Ed also seems to be incredibly selfless, showing a great care for Eddie and Double D, even offering to give them his two jawbreakers that he won as a prize, so that the other two wouldn't get left out. And of course, Ed definitely comes out with the best one-liners in this show. Ed, you put the sign on upside down! No, I put the sign on the garage! Ed, what are you doing in my bed? I can't sleep, Eddie. I keep thinking, how can my feet smell if they don't have a nose? I'm a woodpecker. Except with dirt. Though not having much brain, Ed certainly makes up for it in brawn, often showing incredible feats of strength, which I reckon he could easily use to take down Goku, Superman, and One Punch Man all at the same time. I mean, just look at this guy, and how he takes this steel structure and chews it up like it was a piece of gum. Another trait to Ed was his wild imagination, which is heavily inspired by the comic books and classic sci-fi monster movies he often watches. Sometimes this imagination gets the better of Ed as he begins to merge reality and fantasy, trying to replicate a comic book story by sacrificing Jimmy's Mr. Yum Yum and even taking on the identity of a monster when put into a costume, terrorizing the entire cul-de-sac. Outside of sci-fi shows, Ed also has a love for buttered toast, gravy, and of course, chicken. Chicken! Pet the chicken, pet the chicken! Though sometimes I worry that Ed may love chickens a little bit too much. Then we have Ed, voiced by Sam Finson. My hands are contaminated by the filth of chicanery! Oh, what dastardly deed have we sowed! Who writes this guy's stuff? Whom, because his name is spelt with two Ds as opposed to just one, everyone refers to him as Double D. Double D is the brains in the trio, often coming up with the crazy contraptions to help with Eddie's scams. He also comes across as the most mature of the Eds, offering an empathetic and polite attitude. Best do as he says, Eddie, lest we open old wounds. Curse diverse cultures. W wait, what did he just say? Curse diverse cultures. Curse diverse cultures. Curse diverse cultures. Oh, wait, no, never mind. I guess he's actually just a massive racist. Despite his maturity, the downfall to Double D is that he suffers from a lot of anxiety and doesn't perform too well in sports, making him a bit of an outsider with the other kids. You throw like a two-year-old. In saying that though, Double D is probably the most liked Ed out of the three Ed boys, due to him having higher moral standards, feeling elements of guilt, and offering condolences should Ed and Eddie ever go too far with their antics. The biggest trait to Double D is the hat that he's always seen wearing in the show, 
And you? What's with the hat? What are you hiding? Ah! We, the audience, never actually get to see what's under his hat throughout the series. Though we do get to see Ed and Eddie's reaction to seeing what's underneath in one episode. Okay, that's it! I'm gonna give you such a thrashing! Jeez Louise, cool. Seen as how Antonucci himself also hasn't revealed what's under his hat. What's under Double D's hat, Danny? I'm not telling. It's, that's, that's the question. It's possible that we may never know the truth. And no, I don't count the Flash game as an official reveal, as it wasn't made by the original production team. So, I guess all we can do for now is speculate, which many, many people have. Me personally? I think he's a skinhead with a giant swastika tattoo. That's disturbing. Last and certainly least, in height, I'm not little! we have Eddie, voiced by Tony Sampson. Eddie is the leader of the Eds. He has a loud mouth, cocky attitude, and is driven by greed. Basically, he's like a version of Daffy Duck. <laughs> I'm a coward, but I'm a greedy little coward. Though Double D is the brains in the group, it is usually Eddie who comes up with the scams. Eddie is the shortest of the Eds, which may be one of the reasons he feels the need to compensate for this with his loud actions and extravagant lifestyle. If you can't beat him, show up. Let's mumble. Ooh, ooh. Though Eddie puts on a hard front of coming across as confident and not caring, there are moments in the show where we see a softer and more vulnerable side to him. What you want? I'm bulletproof, baby! Indicating that over cash and jawbreakers, Eddie may be just wanting to fit in and be liked. Along with the Eds, there's also the other kids in the cul-de-sac who each have their own personalities and diverse ways. Let's start with Johnny. Johnny 2x4. Johnny is kind of that weird kid on the block who can even annoy the other kids from time to time. Chill and hang with me. Over there! So much so that the Eds even exploited this in one episode by charging the other kids money just to get rid of him. Because of this, Johnny is actually a little bit of a loner and is often seen just hanging out with his buddy Plank. Kill them, Johnny. Kill them all. Plank? Plank is... a plank of wood, with some eyes and a smile drawn onto him. And though we're led to believe that Plank is purely a fabrication of Johnny's imagination, there are certain times in the series where he does almost seem to become sentient. He is over there, the little rascal. I guess it's kind of like the Mr. Garrison and Mr. Hat relationship. But there's also that episode where the Eds try to make new imaginary friends for Johnny, and it sends him into a mental breakdown. What? Who are you? Dance? No, I thought. Oh, no, I like you too. <laughs> So, yeah, maybe Johnny's just a schizophrenic. Then we have Kevin, who's your typical neighborhood jock, who wears his cap backwards because he's just that cool. Kevin is probably the biggest rival to the Eds, always cynical to their schemes and able to see through much of the bullshit that the other kids can't. This obviously doesn't make him the biggest fan of the Eds, as he usually refers to them as dorks. system will ensure my relatives have fresh fish for dinner. Ah, Rolf. Rolf is probably my favourite of the side characters. Some of the lines of dialogues he comes out with are just brilliant. Your garden is overgrown and your cucumbers are soft. <laughs> Rolf, as you can probably guess, isn't native to the cul-de-sac and originally grew up somewhere in Eastern Europe, where we see a lot of these countries' unorthodox customs in the show. Despite all of these customs, we never actually find out where it is Rolf is specifically from, and even creator Danny Antonucci himself admits that he doesn't know where Rolf actually comes from. I don't know where the heck he's from, you know, and, and, and he has the weirdest relative. Then we have Naz. Who's your typical popular girl? She's good looking, athletic, not the sharpest knife in the drawer, but kind hearted. Victor changed his name to Naz, just like me! Are you weak in the upper story? And the girl that all the cul-de-sac boys have a crush on, 
except for Rolf and Jimmy. Unfortunately, there's not really much to say about Naz, as most of her character identity comes from how the other boys react around her. And then there's... Sarah. Sarah has got to be my least favourite character in the show. She's Ed's younger sister, and her entire purpose is just to be loud or making her older brother's life a living hell. Despite the fact that Ed is actually really caring towards her, Sarah never returns any of that affection. Give me my dolly, you big flummox! Sarah has that typical spoilt brat little sister attitude, and as a result is very loud and hyper aggressive. And this would only become worse as the series went on. Where she starts off as just an annoyance in season 1, she becomes straight up unbearable by season 5. One of my favourite moments from the show is from an episode in season 4 where Ed is uncharacteristically angry and finally puts her in her place. Yeah, fuck you Sarah. Then we have Jimmy. who is often found hanging out with Sarah. Like Sarah, Jimmy is a bit younger than the rest of the cul-de-sac kids, and comes across as the weak, scared, and naive-minded individual, often becoming an easy target for the Eds. Though as the episodes went on, Jimmy would prove himself to be a lot more cunning and sinister than he lets on, even using his naive image to be able to shift blame over to the Eds for something that he did. It was horrible, Sarah. They made me eat dirt all day. <laughs> what? And finally, we have the Kanker Sisters. I'm May Kanker. I'm Marie Kanker. And I'm Lee Kanker. Who live in the trailer park just outside of the cul de sac. The Kankers are the main antagonists of the series, both feared and hated by all the other kids. The main trope of the Kanker Sisters was their crush that they have on the Eds and would often try to force themselves upon them in a creepy and sometimes pretty rapey manner. Now, I don't want to be that guy, but let's just imagine that the gender roles were reversed and it was three teenage guys trying to force themselves onto three younger girls. Yeah, I don't think people would have been quite as content with them if that was the case. <laughs> this creep factor goes up even further when we look at a deleted scene from season 4, which shows that in the future the Eds not only end up marrying the Kankers, but also have many children with them too. One thing to note about all the characters in the show though, is just how visually distinct they all are, possessing bright or highly contrasting colours to make them pop out from the background, and even if we take away the colours, all the characters can be instantly recognised from their unique style. Which brings me on to the show's next great asset, the animation. The show was animated by AKA Studios, a Canadian based company. Even if they were Canadian, heaven forbid. Danny Antonucci is a very passionate person when it comes to the art style and animation, holding very strong views against modern digital animation fuck digital and, draw. Yeah. <laughs> right yeah. and cartoons that have non artists in control of the director's chair very very rare i mean now you've got writers who are doing animation and it's like antonucci was a huge fan of the golden age era cartoons particularly that of the classic looney tune shorts which ran from the 1930s to 1950s and thus wanted his cartoon to be produced in a similar way because of this ed ed and eddie would be the last major cartoon series to use the traditional cell painted animation technique where individual drawings are put onto clear sheets of plastic and coloured in with paint. Antonucci also put great emphasis on each frame being uniquely hand drawn, offering fluid movement, great detail and wacky character styles. Even by how the characters move on screen visualises their personality. Ed, carefree, goes with the flow. Double D, stiff upper right posture, cautious. And Eddie, passionate and greedy. The most distinct feature you'll notice about the show's animation is how the characters have this wiggly outline, even when stood still. I mean, the lines are all wiggly! 
These are known as boiling lines, and it's achieved by tracing a drawing multiple times through sheets of paper. When questioned about this unique art style, Antonucci explained, it helps keep the characters alive. Similar to what I stated about the constant fur twitching in my review of the Isle of Dogs. Along with the animation itself, you'll probably notice some of the other unique styling choices, such as how the kids all possess different coloured tongues, which is meant to be due to all the different coloured sweets the kids are known for eating. Danny Antonucci says that he likes imperfection in animation, which is ironic considering Antonucci himself was considered such a perfectionist. I think I did uh, 250 takes of the line, yep, good times. <laughs> no kidding, 250 takes. But in all honesty, I do agree with him. I think imperfection in animation is what gives it more charm. Like, you see the human work that goes into it. It's why I like the older Ardman animation stuff, where you would still see the hand marks on the models, where they would be constantly moved around by the people behind the scenes. As well as the great animation, the show would also have some of the wackiest and unique sounds of any cartoon. Just look at this clip here as an example. <laughs> A comedian, huh? <laughs> the sound design for the effects and actions has to be one of the best I've seen in any show. So many random effects used that really gives the show its identity. The musical score would also have this 60s jazz-like theme to it, all composed by Patrick Card. And the show's theme with its iconic whistle was actually whistled by Antonucci himself. Okay, well, that's everything that was right with the show. So, now let's talk about what went wrong. Season 4 was meant to be the final season of the show. And this is evident by the final episode of the season, Take This Ed and Shove It. Notably the second Ed, Ed and Eddie episode to be split into two parts. In this episode, Eddie begins to notice how the other kids in the cul-de-sac are beginning to grow up. And so to take advantage of this, the Ed set up a job center where the other kids are assigned their future careers. For the most part, the episode plays out quite normally. Until at the end, where we cut to the Ed's 90 years in the future, where it turns out that all the adventures in the previous episodes were simply the result of Eddie daydreaming about the time they were kids. It seems you dozed off again there, Eddie. You were recounting yet another humorous story from our past when we were children. It's actually a pretty dark ending, as the realization of this occurs right before Eddie is about to tuck into a jawbreaker, announcing that he never wants to grow up. I don't ever want to grow up. <laughs> And as the episode closes, Eddie claims, I still wish I was a kid! <laughs> Maybe it's because I now sit here in my late boomer 20s that I find this so much more relatable, reminiscing back on simpler times as a child where there seemed to be a lot less stress and worry in the world. Waking up to Saturday morning cartoons and dying over and over to that stupid level in Crash Bandicoot. And so, the Ed, Ed and Eddie series have come to a close, and one of Cartoon Network's greatest and most popular shows had come to an end. Whatever! The brand new series of Ed, Ed and Eddie starts 30th of October on Cartoon Network. But first, a quick word from this video's sponsor. Does your life stink like this, guys? <laughs> I can't read. Well then, it sounds like you could benefit from Audible. Audible is the leading provider of spoken word entertainment and audiobooks. And yeah, you can still use this service even if you are literate. I personally don't read too many books due to my short attention span, but being able to listen to them in the car during long drives is something much more suited to my lifestyle. I found myself listening to the original Coraline book, 
which you can have narrated by Dawn French or the original author himself, which is pretty awesome. It was interesting to hear how different some of the book's elements are compared to the film, such as Coraline's personality, the absence of Wyborn, and how it ends. What's this gonna cost us hardworking stiffs? Yeah, I bet it costs a lot! Not at all. If you go to audible.com forward slash Steve Reviews or text Steve Reviews to 500 500, you can start listening immediately with a 30 day free trial, plus one free audiobook of your choice, and two Audible originals. Thank you so much for listening guys, now back to the review. A year after season 4 had ended, season 5 begins. I guess old man Eddie continues daydreaming and our favourite show is back on the air, only this time with some notable changes. Those of you that are keen eyed may have noticed something a little off about the look of the show. Well that's because the show had now moved on from its traditional ink and cell technique over to modern digital colouring. Now I don't want to particularly criticise the show too hard on this, as I know Antonucci was a huge hater of digital animation, Fuck digital and, draw. and I know he would have done everything within his power to keep the show with its traditional methods. And to be fair, for the most part the show does look identical to the previous four seasons, even managing to maintain those iconic boiling lines. But you can see that the colour palette just isn't quite as colourful, everything seems darker and doesn't pop out onto the screen. Those slight imperfections of ink and cell blotches are gone and replaced with a perfect crisp digital colouring. But season 5 wasn't just a new season series wise, but also a new season weather wise. The show took a pretty bold approach in that season 5 would now take place in the autumn and winter whereas the previous four seasons had now been established to have taken part over the summer holidays. Kinda like Gravity Falls. This is explained to us in the first episode where Eddie is still trying to convince the other kids that it's still summer, by creating an artificial climate in the cul-de-sac. But when the illusion is broken, the other kids freak out as they realise school will be starting tomorrow. School starts tomorrow? Yeah. Yep, school. This was an interesting move by the show, because as we touched upon earlier, the kids seem to exist in a world which is uninhabited by anyone else. So if the kids were to attend school, would there be other kids there to potentially be introduced as new characters? And would there be teachers there to act as new antagonists? Well, no. At least, not exactly. In the similar sense to seasons 1-4 to four where there's heavy indication that the parents are existing off screen, so too is it for the teachers at the school. The teacher's watching us, Eddie. Though sometimes we do actually physically see part of the adult characters. We see them interacting with objects and have the kids interacting with them directly. I like that they attempted to go with this approach, but as a setting it really doesn't fit with the show. It stretches the logic of the show when the entire school is attended by a dozen children, to the point that even the Kanker sisters are sat in the same classrooms as the other kids, despite you know, the Kanker sisters being several years older. And now that we've established that these authority figures actually exist in the school, it seems odd that all these ludicrous events are still able to occur without any adult intervention. At least in the previous seasons it was only implied that the parents existed. But here, we physically see them on screen. Another problem with the school system is that it breaks the dynamic between the Eds and the other kids. See, it's always implied that the Eds weren't necessarily bad people, they were just loners. And that if they had the opportunity to join in with the other kids, they may just get along. Well, here in the school setting, they are forced into the same activities as the other kids, but still end up ruining everything which makes me think that even if the other kids did accept the Eds, they would still mess it up. Which kinda trails me into my next point, and that's at how bad the characters have developed. Now if I'm gonna be completely honest, I think these negative character traits actually started in Season 4, but they definitely got worse in Season 5. Let's start with my favourite character, Ed. 
Look on a mask with my boy. Ed was my favorite character because of his simple yet brilliant one-liners. I found my sensitive side because it has a rash. Oh! Thank you for sharing that with us, Ed. His unpredictable actions and his happy-go-carefree attitude to life. He was a very wholesome character. But now he's gone from a bit of a simpleton to a complete and utter retard. His stupidity has gone completely through the roof He's extremely emotional, and his whole character has just been overly simplified. Remember this line from season two? Gravy! Aw, uh, come on, Double D, I don't say gravy all the time. Well, in season five, he's literally obsessed with the stuff, even grinding a desk over his face when he doesn't get his daily fix of it. Then there's Double D. Who, in all honesty, I actually kind of like how his character evolved over the series. Somewhat. He went from being socially awkward and shy, to someone who will not only stand up for himself, but also others too. He has a much more caring and mature attitude, which definitely makes him the most likeable out of the three Eds. Why is this a problem, you may ask? Well, because this new character of his doesn't fit in with Ed and Eddie. See, originally with his anxiety, Double D needed Eddie as that driving force to push him to do things he otherwise wouldn't. Now though, he's quite capable of doing that himself. His newfound value and morals also puts him into direct conflict with Eddie's scams. With Double D normally having to object or apologize to the other kids on Ed and Eddie's behalf. making me wonder why he still hangs out with them in the first place. I mean, Christ, there's even some select moments in the show where Kevin, the Ed-hating jock, is seen having some civil moments towards him. Hey, Double D. What's so funny, hombre? Like, maybe I can still see Double D liking Ed because he sees charm in his stupidity, but I really can't see why he would still choose to hang out with Eddie. Speaking of which, Eddie whom in my opinion by far got hit the worst. The show didn't know whether to be an arsehole towards Eddie or to make Eddie the arsehole himself. Eddie for the most part is just straight up unlikable in this season. The way he treats Ed and Double D with constant aggression makes you wonder why they bother hanging out with him. I mean, I guess Ed would because at this stage he clearly doesn't know any better, but what possible reason does Double D have to hang out with him? The entire dynamic with these three characters has just been ruined. Originally, they all fit a purpose. Ed was the simple-minded but muscle of the group, Double D was the shy yet smart of the group, and Eddie was the driving force that gave them guidance. But beyond all that, they came across as three guys who had a legitimate friendship. Like how Ed and Eddie would have comforted Double D when he was getting bullied and helped him to train in order to become stronger. Now Double D and Eddie just seem to be at constant war with each other. They're now only friends because the script demands it, not because they're actually friends. There was the episode Pick and Ed where Eddie disguises himself as another kid named Carl. The disguise fools the other kids and Eddie is shocked to find that they're all actually being nice to him. So Eddie decides that he will now keep the Carl persona and completely dicks on Ed and Double D in the process. Not likely, friend. I wouldn't hang with these washouts if they were the last two dorks on Earth. <laughs> right on. Only returning back to them because Double D tricks Eddie into thinking that the other kids are still bullying him. But if it wasn't for that, Eddie would have been completely content with abandoning them. And the humor suffered with the show too. Remember how I said in the earlier seasons it had the right balance of slapstick? Well, here it goes way too overboard. Compare the reaction of Eddie suffering from the thorn bush in season one to him suffering from a thorn bush in season five. By the way, when I first saw this episode as a kid, I totally thought this thorn was Eddie's dick. I'm not little. But the biggest issue I had with season five was the writing itself and how episodes played out. With many of the episodes coming across as basic, and simply mistreating the Eds even though they didn't really deserve it. 
And it's only fair to point out, previous seasons did this too. I mean, way back in Season 3's episode, Stiff Upper Ed, I hated how it unjustly treated Double D. But episodes like that were the exception. Whereas in Season 5, they felt like the norm. A few to name example. Tinker Ed. Which, by the way, is an episode which made me realise just how annoying and whiny Jimmy's voice had gotten over time. Anyway, in this episode, Kevin mocks Jimmy for still believing in fairy tales. The Eds notice Jimmy crying and decide they could fake the existence of fairy tales. Yes, Eddie is doing this just for the money, but the gesture is still beneficial for Jimmy. Unfortunately, the whole thing backfires and Jimmy is left depressed once again. Sarah then threatens the Eds that they now have to convince Jimmy that fairy tales are real, so the Eds have to humiliate themselves dressed as fairy tale characters only to realise the whole thing was a setup by Sarah and Jimmy. My gripe with this episode is why was it that the Eds were getting blamed by Sarah? Wasn't it Kevin that started this whole mess? Why is she not pissed off at him? And worse yet, Kevin actually comes out on top at the end of the episode, despite being the arsehole that started the conflict in the first place. Smile for the Ed. This is one of those episodes where the show just decides to be an arsehole to Eddie. Eddie is trying to get a decent school photo, so his mum will give him the keys to his brother's bedroom. As the photo is being taken, Kevin calls him a dork which messes up the picture. The picture then gets shared around the school, and Eddie is mocked by the other kids. Eventually, Double D helps Eddie set up for a second photo, but that too again is ruined by Kevin. The episode ends with Eddie receiving a week's detention for all the photocopies of his face, despite, you know, Kevin being the one who photocopied them, and also for impersonating the school's principal, despite, you know, Double D being the one who impersonated him. To which Double D even lets Eddie take the blame for it. Really? A whole week? Gracious, um... Ed has something for you, Eddie! Yeah, nice morals you got there, Double D. How could I do such a thing? I don't even know who I am anymore! But I think my most hated episode has to be Cleanliness to the Next Ed. This is just a cheap, gross out Double D torture porn, which has Double D becoming increasingly filthy as he desperately looks for a shower. This includes him becoming covered in literal animal shit, which Ed licks off of him later in the episode. Sending Double D insane, despite him, you know, being in filthy situations prior and not having much of an issue with it. And by the end of the episode, Double D is forced to be bathed by Ed, who readies the cheese grater to clean him. Weak writing, poor character treatment, and lazy gross out. So, to conclude this long and overly drawn out analysis, Ed, Ed and Eddie was a remarkable show. It almost felt like the last of its era, and certainly was a high to go out on. Unfortunately though, I think the show just fell victim to the same factor that many other longtime shows have, and that's the pressure to keep upping the antics from previous events. Characters had to become more wild and exaggerated, and episodes had to become more spectacular and shocking, which sacrificed the substance and charm that made the series great to begin with. I know I put a lot of blame on this in Season 5, but in reality, these cracks had already began forming in Season 4. And as sad as it was for the series to end, maybe this was the best time for it. But even though Season 5 had its many, many problems, I'd still consider Season 5 quality to be good when compared to other animated series. It just pales in comparison to what had come from seasons 1 to 3. And though Ed, Ed and Eddie may be gone, the series legacy lives on in our hearts. Every time I hear the word dork, I think of Ed, Ed and Eddie. Every time I see the term cul-de-sac, I think of Ed, Ed and Eddie. And every time I hear... I think of Ed, Ed and Eddie. So, what's the future for Ed, Ed and Eddie? 
Well, as of today, there's been no confirmation of a series of Vival or any kind of one-off specials. When asked about any future projects, Antonucci stated in 2012 that he was currently working on a new series, and in 2017, released a pilot episode for his new series called Snot Rocket. Which is... Interesting. Kind of like a mix of the old Roger Rabbit shorts, where the main character has to babysit a child, but with the wacky imagination of Ed and his story of the Kanker sisters. Ed, your story's getting weird. Just watch the short and you'll see what I mean. I wouldn't exactly call it a masterpiece, but the animation is nice, and I wish Antonucci the best with it. I should probably also mention that within Season 5 there were 4 television specials. These were actually alright. The Christmas special I particularly liked, you know, until the very end, and the Halloween special offered some nice visuals. And of course, the television film finale to the series was it a shimmering light at the end of a dark tunnel to give Ed, Ed and Eddie the send off it deserves? Or was it the final nail in the coffin? Well, this video has gone on long enough, so I will dedicate a review to it in the next one. But thank you so much to you guys that are still watching. I know it was a very long video, but please leave a like if you enjoyed and comment below your thoughts on the Ed, Ed and Eddie series, along with any other series you'd like me to tackle in the future. But until the next one guys, take care.